The IDF did more to safeguard the rights of civilians. What the Israeli Air Force and the Israeli military is doing is a war crime. There is no army in the world that acts in a more moral Blatant fashion. Blatant violations of international humanitarian law. War crime after war crime. Whoa, those are some conflicting accounts of the IDF. It's tempting to ask, which is the more accurate depiction? To wonder whether Israel is actually the most moral army in the whole wide world, or whether it deserves the harsh criticism it often gets. But I think we're asking the wrong question. See, a question like, is the IDF the most moral army, can have only one answer, yes or no. But real life doesn't fit so neatly into that kind of binary. Does the IDF need to be the most moral army in the world? I'm Noam, and you're watching The History of Israel Explained. Yalla, let's do this. I'm obviously not the first person to ask about the ethics of warfare. Today's armies are subject to international humanitarian law, supranational pressures, and public scrutiny, not to mention their own specific ethical codes. And the backbone of the IDF's moral code is the rather poetic concept of Tohar Haneshek, or purity of arms. To maintain purity of arms is to refrain from using unnecessary force and hurting innocent people, which sounds good in theory, until you try to pin it down and match it up to current events. What is unnecessary force? What if you hurt an innocent person by mistake? What if a soldier goes rogue? What if a civilian ignores your orders to evacuate? What if the weapons tunnel was built under a school? Each of Israel's wars brought increasingly thorny questions. For decades, Israel fought for one thing and one thing only, its existence. To paraphrase my favorite villain from Game of Thrones, Cersei Lannister, when you fight an existential war, you win or you die. There is no middle ground. But slowly, the IDF cemented Israel's status as the strongest country in the Middle East. When Israel's enemies realized they could no longer hope to annihilate the state on a traditional battlefield, they changed the game. Some, like Egypt and Jordan, put aside their nation-destroying ambitions and brokered peace. But other players like Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and the Iranian proxy Hezbollah opted for a different kind of war. A war waged not between countries, but between a country and an armed political party that uses terror as a tactic. In military parlance, an asymmetric war. An asymmetric war is a war between two unevenly matched opponents. You'd think the stronger side, in this case Israel, would always have the upper hand, and in some senses it does. It's got better technology, better training, more experience, much more legitimacy on the world stage. But the weaker side, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, or Hezbollah, depending on the day, has an ace up its sleeve. These groups are more than willing to rely on tactics that fly in the face of the IDF's moral code. Purposeful attacks on civilians, kidnapping, hijacking, using human shields. All this presents the IDF with a painful moral dilemma. How should a conventional army engage an enemy that often abandons moral principles and accepted rules of warfare? How do you maintain Toar Haneshek, purity of arms, when you're fighting an enemy embedded amongst civilians? Unfortunately, Israel has had many opportunities to answer these questions. So let's dive into two recent real-world examples to help understand it all. Lebanon, 2006. The north of Israel is green and lush and gorgeous, crisscrossed with hidden springs and cold, rushing rivers. It's also ground zero for Hezbollah attacks. Between 2000 and 2006, Hezbollah terrorized the north of Israel with kidnappings, shootings, stabbings, bombings, and rocket attacks. Then came the war. On July 12th, 2006, Hezbollah fired a barrage of rockets at northern Israel, killing eight Israeli soldiers. This was just a cover for their real power move, abducting two additional soldiers, knowing that Israel would pay a high price for their safe return. But it was Lebanon that paid the price instead. Northern Israel had suffered Hezbollah's provocations for years, and everyone, from civilians to the government to the army, had had enough. Israel hammered Hezbollah, airstrikes, a ground invasion, hand-to-hand -hand combat, all to neutralize the threat from the north. Now, Hezbollah is an interesting enemy. I mean, it's an internationally recognized terrorist group, joys generous backing from Iran. 
boasts more manpower than the Lebanese army, makes up a little over 10% of the Lebanese parliament, and routinely goes over the government's head. Compounding Hezbollah's global impact is a fact that the party simply refuses to abide by any of the conventional rules of warfare. During the 2006 war, the terrorist group used Lebanese civilians as human shields, placing command posts and weapons depots in or near schools, hospitals, mosques, and private residences. They dug pits filled with explosives along the road leading to the Israeli border and conducted their business from rented residential apartments and civilian areas. I'm telling you all of this so you understand the stakes, the huge complexity of fighting an enemy for whom hurting civilians is a feature, not a bug. The war lasted for 34 days. For all 34 of those days, Israel walked a fine line between fighting Hezbollah and preserving civilian lives and infrastructure. The IDF showered Lebanon with Arabic leaflets warning civilians to leave their homes before an airstrike. They called Lebanese telephones with pre-recorded messages in Arabic and broadcast their warnings via loudspeaker. But there's another side to this too, if we're being honest. Warnings are only so effective in densely populated areas. Israeli intelligence estimated that roughly 600 Hezbollah members were killed, along with hundreds of Lebanese civilians. These civilians were innocent people who paid the price for the actions of a rogue terrorist group acting in defiance of Lebanese interests. That breaks my heart because every human life has dignity and every civilian casualty is a tragedy. Hezbollah's leader Hassan Nasrallah later commented, we did not think even 1% that the capture would lead to a war at this time and of this magnitude. You ask me if I had known that the operation would lead to such a war, would I do it? I say no, absolutely not. Surprising words from the leader of a group that hides amongst civilians. Many condemned the Israeli response to Hezbollah as, quote, disproportionate. But Israel certainly did not start the war. Israel did not spend six years shooting indiscriminately into Lebanon or kidnap two soldiers and kill another eight or unleash a barrage of rockets into Lebanon. It's absolutely tragic that civilians died. But the moral responsibility for their deaths lies with Hezbollah. Let's move to a more recent conflict, Gaza 2014. The Gaza Strip has a lot of problems. It's very densely populated with a rapidly growing population. It lacks decent water, sewage, and electrical infrastructure. It's got a high rate of unemployment. Oh, and it's governed by a terrorist group that spends its time and money provoking its neighbors rather than improving life for its people. The terror group Hamas took over the Gaza Strip in 2007 after a nasty civil war with its political rival, Fatah. You know, torture, extrajudicial executions, throwing each other off high-rise buildings, fun stuff like that. So it shouldn't surprise you that they have little compunction about firing rockets on Israeli civilians, kidnapping and killing Israeli civilians, and sending suicide bombers and incendiary balloons to civilian areas. And in case it's not clear, they really don't care about civilians, not Israelis, not Palestinians. And they make that very clear with their tunnels. See, Gaza is crisscrossed by a complex web of concrete tunnels used to smuggle weapons, fuel, food, and occasionally bodies into the Gaza Strip. Tunneling takes money, resources, and labor. Hamas provides that in spades, $150 million, 800,000 pounds of concrete, and in a virtual army of children under 18 whose small, agile bodies can scramble into the tiny spaces under the ground. An organization that uses child labor has little regard for Israeli children. In 2014, Hamas operatives kidnapped three Israeli teenagers. The IDF arrested most of Hamas's operatives in the West Bank. Hamas responded with rocket fire. Israel sent airstrikes. Hamas unleashed more rockets. Israel launched a ground invasion, destroying 34 tunnels and roughly two thirds of Hamas's rocket arsenal. Instead of working to improve Palestinians' lives, Hamas picked a fight they knew they'd lose. They shot thousands of rockets at Israel, a quarter of which fell in Palestinian territory. At least 13 Palestinians, 11 of them children, were killed by Hamas rocket fire in 2014. Okay, Naomi you might say, that's horrible, but Israel killed way more Palestinians than Hamas. Just look at the death toll. Over 2,000 Palestinians died in the 2014 war. That's true and it's painful. Again, I lay the moral responsibility primarily at the feet of Hamas. 
I certainly don't expect Gazans to love Israel, but they have even less reason to love Hamas, which places rocket launch pads in Gaza schoolyards and apartment buildings who digs tunnels directly under a UN-run school. Don't take my word for it, take hers. <laughs> I've never served in a war, and I hope I never do. But I've been around enough people who have to fully believe that there's no such thing as the most moral army, regardless of the righteousness of your cause or the wickedness of your enemy, because war is horrific. So I'm tired of this binary, where the IDF is either the best army or the worst army. The IDF is an army, an army that exists because it has to. One that tries its best to preserve human life in its war against an enemy that too often has no interest in protecting civilians. One that sometimes tragically fails. In the words of the legendary military hero and politician Moshe Dayan, the only choice we have is to be prepared and armed, strong and resolute, or else our sword will slip from our hand and the thread of our lives will be severed. I pray for the day that we can make another choice. But until that day comes, I'm proud that even if the IDF sometimes falls short of its ideals, the IDF reckons with its moral responsibility each and every day. Enjoy, subscribe, keep on learning.